You're listening to Sound, Sound. Insightful. Insightful. Insightful Bible Teaching for a Meaningful, meaningful. For a meaningful, meaningful Christian walk. walk. So we're going over all the messages that were given in the college training. You all got all the verses still memorized, right? <laughs> I don't have Aaron. Brennan here. I've got Zach. Actually, I got two, three, four, five, six, six seven, eight. I got a lot of people I can call. <laughs> well, anyway, um, tonight we're going over uh, the message. It was entitled "Noah Living a Righteous Life and Becoming a Herald of Righteousness." And last week the message was on finding grace. Um, we need to understand what, what being a herald of righteousness is. You all know what a herald is, right? Not the name herald. But, you know. <laughs> He's a guy, he goes out to proclaim something. Mm-hmm. Um, that song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, they were heralds, they're proclaiming the birth of Christ. Mm-hmm. That was the good news. Mm-hmm. So Noah, in his time, he was a herald of righteousness. Um, and we all need to be very clear, you know, the Lord Jesus said, you know, the days of his second coming will be as in the days of Noah. And the days of Noah, on the one hand, seemingly they weren't doing anything that bad, marrying, given in marriage. One thing was very clear, they had no idea that the end was coming. It's like they weren't even aware of God. And then we also know that the angels, fallen angels had come in, uh, taken human wives, had, you know, children with them who were abnormal, um, like powerfully abnormal. But anyway, th- this shouldn't have happened. This is an illegal union. Um, so God came in and he said, man has just become flesh. But you can read there's several passages in the Bible that talk about, you know, the way things will be. Actually, I want to read one. You've all read the Bible, right? So this is 2 Timothy, chapter 3. 2 Timothy was probably the last book that Paul wrote. And so this is like the last chapter in the last book. But it says, Know this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, this is the next one's really bad. Disobedient to parents. You might, it's like ranked up there with all the other things. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, implacable, slanderers, without self control, savage, not lovers of good, traitors, reckless, blinded with pride, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having an outward form of godliness, though denying its power. And he says, from these also turn away. So these are the last days, and this is the condition of mankind. You can read this, and it's like, yeah, this really matches. Then you can apply it to yourself also. Um, You know, the age we live in is an age of um, moral relativity. And if you've never heard that term before, it was in vogue for a while. I don't know if it's that popular now. But basically, it's like, are you, is what you're doing bad or good? And rather than comparing it with an absolute standard, which is God, um, you compare it, well, you know, I'm a little better than Christy. Um, and maybe, you know, I'm not as good as Catherine. But anyway, I'm probably okay. I'm somewhere in the middle. Everything's okay. Without realizing, you know, Christy's really bad. Catherine's really bad. You're just really, be- you know, kind of better compared to someone who's really bad. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. Um, this is the pronouncement in the Bible, both the Old Testament and New Testament. So this is the condition of mankind. Uh, righteous, to be righteous is to be right with God and to be right with man. But we're not. Uh, we have all fall short of the righteousness of God. In Romans chapter 1, 
I, someone looked the verse up to get it exactly, but it's like, um, you know, basically the thought is <clears throat> people will commit sins. And rather than turn from them, they, they take delight in those who practice the same things. So maybe, you know, I do something wrong and my conscience maybe will bother me <coughs> until I see everyone else is doing the same thing. And it's like, oh, it must be okay. Doesn't mean it's okay. It's not a matter of, you know, percentage. Not like 95% of the people are doing the same thing, therefore it must be okay. Just look around, everyone's doing it. Um, no, that doesn't mean it's right. You know, God gave the law through Moses. On one hand, Christ, um, he fulfilled the law, he abolished the law. That doesn't mean he abolished the moral commandments. He got rid of all the ordinances, all the don't eat this, you know, don't wear that, don't do these kind of things. All the moral law, which we could call the Ten Commandments, this is does not get annulled. Um, this is the standard we need to live in. And even in uh, Matthew chapter 5, the Lord Jesus, uh, 5 through 7, this is like the constitution of the kingdom people. We're in the kingdom of God. We should have a certain kind of living uh, that would declare to people what we are. But he said, you know, the law says... Don't murder. He says, if you hate someone, that's equivalent to murder. He, he elevated the law several orders of magnitude. I can probably safely say none of us will murder someone in our lives. I, I hope. Um, maybe most of us won't. But anyway, you know, it, we can say I, I can keep that. How many of you can say you've never hated someone? Right? Um, and then he says, you know, he's talking to men, but it's the same thing. If a man looks at a woman with lust, you know, it says, don't, don't commit adultery, don't commit fornication. But it's just like, even if you have some lust, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just like, who can do this? Well, no man can do it. But God can do it. Uh, you know, the another story. It might seem like a wandering. I'm not. Uh, the rich young ruler, he came to the Lord and he said, you know, I want to follow you. You know, what must I do to enter into the kingdom of the heavens? And Jesus, if you read the different, different accounts in the different gospels, one of them, I think it's probably Luke, it said he had compassion on this one. So he didn't just give him a command which is going to make it hard. It's not like, oh, just go away. I'm going to give you an impossible command. He said, you know, you only lack one thing. And he's like, yeah, I've kept the commandments. I've done all these things. He said, good, good, good. You only lack one thing, just one thing. And then he said, sell all that you have. In one account, he says, give to the poor and then follow me. And he went away. He turned, turned away because he was really rich. Yeah. Um, and then his disciples said, this is like impossible. Who can be saved? And Jesus said, with, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So even though it seemed like a very, very high command, he only made one mistake. He turned away from following Jesus. If he would have kept following Jesus, he would have been able to do it. So we need to find grace. Otherwise, we cannot live a righteous life. It's not in us. It's not in our nature. You try. You try to be good. I mean, I, I, I challenge you. I dare you. Um, try to do it for a day. Try to do it for an hour. You know, if you, do you think you, just one hour, Hannah, can you be righteous for one hour? Huh? You already gave up? <laughs> Someone says, I can do it at least for an hour. You won't. Something will happen. You'll maybe minor, but it's just not in our being. It's not in our nature. But if we find grace, if we take grace, if we enjoy the Lord as our life, there's only one that's righteous, and that's Christ. 
When we become believers, we get the life of Christ in us, in our spirit. If we walk by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, if we enjoy the Lord, spontaneously we become righteous. But when we turn from the Lord to try to work out our own righteousness by ourselves, you know, in our fallen humanity, we just can't do it. And then the result is we can feel condemned, we feel bad, understandably. I'm a failure. Yeah, okay, you're a failure. God knows that. God knows you can't do it. That's why he said, I'll do it. He did everything for us. He died for us, so you don't have to die. Isn't that good? You know, we, we should be under God's condemnation. But we're not, because Christ died for us. So our sins are forgiven. But we still need that righteous living. And that only comes through the Lord living in us, and living out of us. You know, um, Noah had this. Noah found grace. I mean, you can argue Old Testament, could he have Christ and all. Just, this is all in type, right? Uh, we can understand that. But he found grace in the sight of Jehovah. He found favor. Then he became a herald, a proclaimer of righteousness. Uh, he didn't, he, I don't think, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think he went door to door to all of his neighbors. Hey, believe in Jehovah. You know, your, your living is wrong. Stop doing that. He was too busy building the ark. Now, maybe he did that. Maybe he did that. But anyway, the ark itself was the greatest proclamation of righteousness. I mean, it's huge. It's not like he's building it in his basement. No one knows he's doing it. He's not even doing it in his backyard. It's too big. It just, you know, I don't know where he was doing it, whether they owned land. Anyway, you know, the thing's huge. You, know, you can see a, a scale model of it in Kentucky. Uh, I've, never, I've never been. I've heard it's pretty good. Um, some things kind of, not so sure. But um, anyway, this just is a testimony. Because people are like, what, what is going to happen? What, why are you building this? And I'm sure he told them. It wasn't a mystery to him. God said, I'm going to wipe everything out. And so this evil age that you're living in, that you love, is going to end. And they'd say, why would God do such a thing? Oh, well, it's because it's evil. Because it's against God. I mean, because people aren't holding even the knowledge of God in their hearts. So, you know, Jehovah is going to come in and wipe it out. You know, you need, you need a, what, um, a barometer. You need something to measure. You know, are, are you behaving righteous, righteously? Depends on your standard. Depends on your standard. She's got the right answer. But, I mean, if you don't have a standard, what you're left with is just looking around, right? Yeah. I'll compare myself with Peter. He's been alive long. <laughs> How am I doing? Seems like I'm doing pretty good, you know. But God's standard, he could come in and say, why are you looking at Peter? He's just, just as bad as you. you got to look at God's standard. And, you know, it's like when you're doing something, you maybe have had this experience, um, anything. You're doing something, and then you ask someone, how, how How is it? Maybe you baked something or you did something. And um, usually people are really nice. You know, you, you <laughs> bake something and it's really lousy. Um, especially if it's your parents. They'll say, oh, that's so good. And it's just like, it's so bad, I can't <laughs> even swallow it. Um, or, you you know, the little kids draw a picture and you have no idea what it is. You say, oh, this is wonderful. We'll put it in the refrigerator. Um Parents aren't that cruel. Usually people aren't that mean to say, they say, isn't this a great picture? And they say, no, it's a lousy picture. I don't even know what it is, you know. Why is the grass red? I mean, just... <laughs> so we can, we can be that way with God. Um, you know, the, and people living in this age, you know, not like everyone is so evil, right? 
A lot of people want good things, um, but they're going about it the wrong way. Ultimately, the only thing that's going to bring in righteousness, peace, justice, all these things is the Lord's second come. Anything else is in the wrong realm. So you could live a good life. I mean, you really could live a good life. Helping people, being kind to people. Um, where's the verse? Daniel, you probably know it. It's like our righteousness, our righteous deeds are just like filthy rags. Um, everything falls short. So we need God. Um, in Matthew, I looked this one up, 5, verses 14 through 16, he talks about, you know, you are the light of the world. Right? And you don't hide that light. You want it to shine up. You know, it's not just a nice analogy. It's like, oh, I'm the light of the world. You know, something like that. This little light of mine, I'm going to make it shine. Why do you need a light? Because it's dark. If you come, if it's daytime, you don't need to turn the lights on. But at nighttime, when it's dark, you need a light. What this means is that this age is dark. So he's talking about not just you individually, but you corporately as a church. There should be a testimony of something that shines. Um, I, I want to read these verses different set. What is it? This is 2 Peter chapter 4. I'll read them to you. I think I can do it. Come on. You know, I'll rest for a second. It's not Oh, Lord Jesus, because there's no second Peter chapter 4. <laughs> Just give me a second. It's a verse. Huh? It's, it's a verse eight. I can't tell you the verse because I wrote it down wrong. <laughs> See, we're all falling. We make a lot of mistakes. Do you remember the gist of what the verse says? I can give you the gist of what the verse says. Um, it's like, you know, the people, they'll think it's strange that you don't follow them in the same unrighteous ways. What is it? First Peter 4. First, oh, I wrote down Second Peter. Okay, sorry. Why don't you read it? Save time. Mm. Uh, there's two verses. So yeah. Which both of that? Um, three and four. For the yeah. time which has passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having gone on in licentiousness, lust, debaucheries, carousings, drinking bouts, and lawless idolatries. In this they think it strange that you are not running together with them into the same flood of dissoluteness, slandering you. This is, this is you and the world. What this is saying is we should be different than the world. I mean, it says they think it's strange that you're not going along with them to do all the things that they do. If we're going along with them doing all the things that they do, they'll just conclude you're the same as them. Now, I'm not saying, okay, let's deliberately try to be weird or different. No, we don't have to do that. But there should be some kind of a testimony. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've not, like always, most of the time, I'm not that vocal about my faith. I don't go telling people, hey, I'm a Christian. Maybe I should. I'm not saying that's right. But anyway, um, I do know one time, actually, this is a person I talk to also, but... Um, I won't give you the whole situation, but he was a co-worker, and he told someone else that I knew. And he said, I can't figure Dave out. Totally. He says, he just seems like a normal guy. Um, jokes around with everybody, just like everybody else. 
He says, but there's something different about it. Um, I really appreciated that. He wasn't trying to compliment me. But, you know, even at work, um, one place I work, every Friday at our lab, they'd go to some bar, you know, have a couple drinks or something, and I, I would not go with them. I didn't say, hey, I'm a Christian. I can't do that. There were a few times I did tell people I'm a Christian. I can't do that. Um, but I just said, no, I don't want to go. And eventually they stopped asking. It's like, why, why would, don't, don't waste your breath. We weren't unfriendly. You know, they didn't ostracize me. But anyway, there's, there's some kind of a testimony. When I was, um, oh, when I was in high school, I was not, I mean, I was brought up in a certain denomination. Um, God was not real to me. I would follow kind of the ordinances or whatever to some degree. But um, I had a friend, and he was going to ask some girl out to a dance. I can't remember what the situation was. But I do remember what happened. And he went to talk to her, and he's my friend. I said, how'd it go? And he said, she turned me down. He said, her, re her religion doesn't allow her to do that. And I'm like, she's in the same church I am. <laughs> I, I'd never heard, so it's like, I didn't say this, I'm thinking, she probably just doesn't want to go out with you. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe her parents were more strict. I don't know. But anyway, it's just like, you know, religion does not restrict us. My religion didn't restrict me from doing anything. You know, really. Um, I, was, I was, you know, a pretty good boy. I wasn't that bad. But on the other hand, I was just typical, typical guy. Um, until I got saved. I was a graduate student, just, just beginning grad school. And I joined up with a group like this. And someone spoke a very clear word on the gospel, told me about God's economy, and I got pretty dynamically saved. Um, I didn't immediately, you know, go change everything outward, but I was different. Um, a couple of years after that, I remember this very distinctly, uh, I had gone home to where my parents lived, a small town in Montana. And, um, you know, everybody knows everybody. And one day my mother was somewhere and she ran into an old friend of mine who somehow inquired about me. And, um, she said, oh, I'm in town. And they said, we're having a party tonight at someone's house. Tell Dave to come by. Now before I would have been right there. Um, but it's like, should I go? Zoe, should I go? Mm -hmm. You're saying no. Zach, should I go? <laughs> I'll tell you what happened. So, it's like, I did want to see all my friends. And it's like, I can go to this party. And I don't have to drink anything or do any of the things that they're doing. I can just go, right? Can't I? Can't I? Everyone's saying no. I mean, come on. <laughs> Could, couldn't I just go? Sounds like you're arguing yeah, with somebody. exactly. So I got in my car, and I, like I said, this small town. We used to drive up and down Main Street. It took like two minutes each way. Um, and I dro drive, drove, and then I drive by that house where the party was, and I drive around. And finally I said, this is so stupid. I'm just wasting time. I, let me, I'll just go in. So I parked the car, and it took me a while to get out of the car. I got up to the top step on the porch, and the doorbell was right there. I could not press the doorbell. And I turned around and went home. And I didn't feel bad. And I got home, and my mother said, didn't you go? And I didn't really tell her what happened, but I just said, no. I, I don't want to go. Actually, I couldn't go. Now. To her, that would seem strange. And to a lot of people, it would seem strange. Other people would say, yeah, this is strange, but why? 
what's the problem? Um, I've got I've got a lot of Christian friends. They go to parties, right? I got a lot of Christian friends. They do everything. They're just no different than the people in the world. So in Noah's time, if you were not building the ark, if you weren't part of that, being a herald of righteousness, of finding grace, you you were going to perish. This age is the same. You know, we've we've all been saved from perdition. We're not going to hell. We're you know we're not got under God's eternal judgment. But have we been saved from the evil and perverted generation? You know, Paul in Philippians, he says, work out your own salvation. Well, we know salvation is not by works. But did Noah have to work to build the ark? He'd found grace. In a way, you could say he's saved, right? But he was not yet saved from that generation. The only way to be saved from that generation is to build the ark. Because once the ark is built, the generation ends. But then, because he's built into the ark, he's separated, and he gets saved. You know, all know the Apostle Paul, right? Not personally, but you've heard of him. Um, he'll, He'll sometimes list some of his, you know, traveling companions, ones who are with him. There's one, one, one fellow named Demas, and he's mentioned three or four times, you know, Demas greets you, Demas is with me. At the end of 2 Timothy, the last book, he said, all in Asia have forsaken me. And he says, Demas left me. Why? He says, having loved the present age. I don't know that that, you can't say he loved doing evil. But to be this kind of a, living the life that Paul lived, with this kind of righteousness, you know, willing to suffer persecution, he might have just said, I want to go where it's comfortable. You know, in, in um, you know, we're, we're, we, when we talk about this, of course, we think of all the sinful things, evil things, and for sure, that's right. Um, but even among Christians, and I'm not talking about among Christians, you know, doing evil things. Of course, Christians can do a lot of evil things too. But sometimes there are, you know, Christian leaders and they know the truth. They they know the truth, but they're afraid to speak it. You know, to speak a word like this, a word of righteousness, it's not easy for people to take. They want to hear, Jesus loves you, you can do whatever you want. Right? Um, everything's okay. Because God loves you and you're forgiven. Isn't that wonderful? God loves us. And God someday is going to take us away to some place in the sky and going to get a mansion, golden streets. For someone to say, you know, that's really not according to the Bible. And your life does matter, how you live your life. I understand there's a difference between judicial salvation and being fully saved, being fully reconciled with God. A lot of people won't receive that. I speak from experience. If I was a pastor somewhere, and you start start speaking a word of righteousness, according to the truth, you won't be pastor there very long. Because people want to just hear something sweet and nice. A lot of times the word is sugar-coated, make it easier to take. A lot of times they don't speak the full truth. And yet they know. You know, these guys are not stupid. Some of them, they're, they're stuck in the tradition they were raised in. Others, it's like, and it takes a lot of courage. I mean, Martin Luther took a lot of courage. He was the right man at the right time. But on the other hand, I mean, he was really going against a lot. He had, he had a job. I mean, he was a monk, right? I don't know if that's a job, but anyway, he was important. So it's like, don't make waves, just, you know. Do your job, you'll get a nice retirement package. Um, everyone likes you. But no, he said, you know, that this way is wrong. It's not salvation by works, it's salvation by grace. And a lot of other practices he spoke against. And he wasn't, he didn't get killed. Others did. 
I mean, for seeming things that are just unfathomable to us. One guy was it um, Wycliffe, right? He translated the Bible into English, and they burned him at the stake. It's like, isn't that good? Wouldn't, isn't it good to translate the Bible into it? Oh, well, they knew if you did that, then people are going to read the Bible. And they're going to find out what you're doing, and what you've been teaching them is wrong. Which shows the thing was very corrupt. But much of you know Christian teaching today is it's very watered down. I mean, wouldn't say it's absolutely wrong, but it doesn't go far enough. So it's it's really the case. Um, you speak the word of truth, Daniel. Um, and not everyone's going to accept it, but we have our conscience. And we we can't but speak according to the word. Sometimes you know. You know, there's people out begging there, you know, whatever their sign says. I don't know how much of it you can believe. But there's one guy, he had a sign I could really believe. He said, why lie? I want a beer. Mm-hmm. You know, he was not saying, oh, my family's hungry or, you know. I mean, there are genuinely people like that. But, you know, a lot of times they're begging for money. And they don't want food they want you know, have to buy drugs or something like that. This guy was honest. He said, I'm not, you know, I can't remember exactly what it said, you know, why buy, why lie, I'm going to go buy some booze or something. Um, I was with my dad when we saw that one. We both thought that was really funny. We didn't give him any money, but at least he's honest. So there's one thing, you know, it's like, it's like recognizing unrighteousness as unrighteousness. But we don't do that. When I say we, I mean collectively. Right? We should do it. But there's just a kind of a... People are blinded. Um, you know, I'll, 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 there's something I want to do, which I, you know, I know I shouldn't do, but maybe... If, I'm not going to talk to Peter. He's too righteous. Um, let me find someone else. I'm not going to pick any of you either. <laughs> But someone who'll, who'll agree with me. I had this happen one time. I wasn't talking about doing anything unrighteous, but it was whether I'm going to follow the Lord or not in a certain way. And I talked to someone, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you don't need to do that. And in one sense, I was really happy. I got another brother older than me. He's telling me I don't need to do that. But inwardly, I was really bothered. It's like he should not say that. Because I knew that this was not what his, I knew his speaking was not according to the Lord. Another time I talked to a brother, just to, kind of my age, about something. And I, I was looking for another way out of something. And again, not to do something sinful, but not following the Lord. It'd be like, you know, um, Jonah. He was commanded to go preach the gospel in Nineveh. And he didn't want to because he wanted them all to die. And he says, if I go preach the gospel, then Jehovah, you'll have mercy on them and you won't kill them. So I don't want to go. <clears throat> but he had no one to back him up. If he could have found another prophet, he'd say, yeah, 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 you don't need to go say that. So that's what I was looking for. I was talking to a brother, and it's like something, whatever it was. And he just nodded and he said, well, anyway, we just need to follow the Lord. And I'm like, oh, you're not going to back me up on not following the Lord. But on the other hand, what he spoke was what I needed. He spoke kind of a sure word. He wasn't just trying to make me happy. I wasn't unhappy, but he didn't give me what I wanted to hear. He gave me what I needed to hear. So we all need to be these kind of heralds of righteousness, not in the way of, you know, going around with a big wooden cross, big sign. You're all going to hell. That's not what we're talking about. But we should have a testimony of the life in us being lived out. You know, this little light of mine inside of me, I'm going to let it shine. That's a children's song, but it's very true. We need to let this shine out. This will convict people. 
this will convict people. I'm not saying you don't need to speak, but this will convict people even without speaking. When they're around Zoe, they should have the feeling, I was just going to do something really sinful, but just being around her, I need to go somewhere else. I'm going to go do something sinful. Just because there's a testimony. It's like you're in the presence of God. Don't you want to be this way? I think we all are to some degree. This is what Noah was. This is what the ark was.